Welcome to Chicago's Bravest Stories. Today we're going to sit down with Father Tom Mulcrone, 37 years on the Chicago Fire Department as our chaplain. He's going to talk about his most memorable incidents and some of the stories that he's acquired over the past. First of all, thank you for being here, Father Tom. We appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Um, we kind of just want to jump in right away. So you've been the third chaplain for CFD in all of CFD history. You've been through five mayors and 10 commissioners. Correct. First of all, when we started this podcast, your name kept coming up over and over again on yeah. guests that we needed to have on. So it's amazing to actually have you here on episode two. Mm-hmm. Um, I want a list of names <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to tell their confessional stories. Oh, it was not hard getting your phone number. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But, you know, Steve wanted me to include this in the podcast. We got your number. I kind of put it on Steve because I was so nervous to talk to you. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you have to admit that 30 years on the fire department, there's a little bit of like celebrity status that comes. You're on TV all the time. You're out in the public eye. You know, you're one of the hardest working people that that I know on the fire department. And, you know, that's not just for me. That's everybody we've talked to about you. So, I kind of put it on Steve. I was like, okay, you know, you got this, Steve, because uh, he has a little bit of history with you and his family. Steve, uh, next thing I know, I get a text with your contact information. So <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll make the phone call. So it um, took me a couple of days to get up the nerve to actually call you. I called you, and then it seemed like you hung up on me. So I was like, Oh, my God, Father Tom just hung up on me. So I'm at home, and I get a text message. If I don't recognize the phone number, I hang up. (laughs) I'm at home, I get a text message. Uh, I think Father Tom just hung up on me. Vince, what did you do? (laughs) But I was like, I don't know where we go from here. Like, what is that, you know? So I sent you the text, and here we are. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Glad to do it. We wanted to find out, because, you know, this was 30 years ago that you were brought into the fire department. How did that come about? Like, who was before you, and did they come up and ask you? Like, how did that transpire? Well, it's it, it's actually 38 years because <laughs> I began as the assistant chaplain in 1981. Okay. And what had happened was back then there was an organization, then it was called Civil Defense, and it became Emergency Preparedness and Disaster Service. And it was a group of volunteers, uh, most of them young guys, and who really wanted to be firemen. And, and a number of them are on the job, even today. In fact, the chief of Schiller Park uh, started out in EPDS. And uh, so... Is that Chiodo? Yeah. 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 I got him in. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. He was, a, he was like a 16-year-old kid, and he just, all he wanted to be was a fireman. <laughs> so... Um, Familiar story. Yeah. 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 So what had happened was I was the chaplain of, of civil defense, and then it became an EPDS. And Father Matt McDonald was the chaplain who preceded me. For the fire department? For the fire department. Okay. And he had an assistant who ended up with macular degeneration and couldn't drive at night. So he knew that I had been with civil defense. So he came to me and he said, would you like to be my assistant? And I said, Yes. And that's how it all began in 1981. So I did that until 1987 when I was appointed the chaplain. How old were you at the time? In 1987, I was 35. Oh, wow. Young guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from what I understand, your grandfather was CPD, Chicago Police Department. Your father was Chicago Police Department. Brothers? Three brothers in law enforcement. I have a sister who's a forensic scientist. Um, so yeah, I come from a police fan. They don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we were kind of alluding to that you're so steeped in Chicago police department and you take a job with the fire department. Like how did that go over with, I mean, you have a brother who was in the Navy, Illinois state police. And CIS. Yeah. Nothing but police in your your lineage. Well, I had an Uncle Jim who was a fireman. He was a fireman on Engine 56. Hmm. And my grandfather, 
my mom's father was kind of a fire fan. He used to hang out at Truck 10's old quarters. He was deaf, and uh, he, he was a great checkers player. And back in the day, they played a lot of checkers in the firehouse, <laughs> among other things. And um, so he, he was very much involved in, in the life of the fire department. And then my uncle Jim became a fireman after he came back from the war. And I would had visited him a number of times at, at Engine 56's house. So I, it was there. I grew up two blocks from 113's house when I was a kid. And I used to kind of hang out there a little bit when I was a kid. So it was there. The seed was planted. Yeah. Yeah. So you also were appointed by Cardinal Bernadine. Correct. Right? You were asked by the standing chaplain with the fire department. No, actually, no. What happens, much like the fire department, um, a vacancy list goes up with priests. So when parishes come available for a pastor or an associate or any special assignment, they publish this and guys apply and then you're chosen depending on the circumstances. So actually, there were seven guys who applied to be the fire chaplain. And you were a busy guy at the time. You were at St. Tars Parish, yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. And you were running all kinds of programs over there. It looked like uh, the Northwest Cluster of Catholic Priests. and Well, that that actually was in, when I was at St. Robert Bellarmine. Okay. Um, my first assignment, I was the chairman of the Northwest Cluster of Priests. So it was 18 parishes on the Northwest side. So it was really just trying to coordinate our pastoral services, coordinate activities. So there wasn't a lot of duplication. There wasn't a lot of redundancy. And uh, it was work. And then I I moderated a, it was actually turned out to be the largest support group for divorced people in the city. It was called Northwest Divorced Catholics. You see the theme, Northwest. Everything (laughs) everything is Northwest. so, and then just the parish activities, you know, both at St. Robert Bowman and at St. Tarsus, we had really great, great teen clubs, youth clubs, uh, very active. So I did a lot of that. I spent a lot of time in the schools. You married my parents at St. Robert's. I did. <laughs> I did. That's how old I am. <laughs> so, Father Tom, also, you're one of eight children. Correct. And, you know, we've kind of gone through that, you know, your whole family has been in law enforcement. And, you know, you kind of branched out onto your own, onto that. But with the five mayors, 10 commissioners, any one of those stick out in your mind as the one that you like the best? Tell us, like, what you thought, who the best mayor was in your position? And, you know, do you have any favorites? Well, no, just for political reasons. I'll (laughs) I'll be careful. But I, I will say this. My experience, and it was only a few short years was Harold Washington really was very supportive of the fire department. Harold Washington, Mm -hmm. for the three years he was mayor, was the only mayor who showed up every year at our memorial service. It was like pulling eye teeth to get mayors to come to this. And they did so begrudgingly. But Harold Washington was there for each one and stayed for each one. And, um, you know, that to me meant a lot that he took the time and and saw the importance of that. Fire commissioners, well, that's another story. Um, Some I've gotten along with very well, and some have been incredibly supportive. Uh, Ray Orozco Sr., Ray Orozco Jr., Bob Hoff, um, you know, just just great guys. Uh, Jose Santiago, you know, I always got along with Jose, and he was always very good to me. I knew... I knew Jose when he was a blue shirt fireman at 76's house and then at squad two. So I, I, some relationships were not so great with fire commissioners, but. uh, Do you think that there was a lot of politics that that was involved with, you know, your position uh, that instead of just being a chaplain, did, did politics come into play in your position? Oh yeah. Well, I, I tried to, avoid the politics, but... I don't think in your position you'd be able to. No, you, you can't. You can't. You really can't. We had... There were there were a couple of things. We, um, early on back in the 90s, all pension legislation is... is uh, t- uh, it happens in the legislature. And 
they were going to take away from the duty death widows their 75% designation. So what they wanted to do was they were had proposed a bill that when their deceased husband would have turned 65, instead of the widows getting their 75% throughout their lives, it would have reverted back to ordinary pension, meaning essentially their pensions would have been cut in half. Cut in half. And there was at the time a omnibus bill in Springfield that had packed all the Chicago Fire Department pension legislation into one bill. And it it had languished and it wasn't going anywhere and these widows felt under the gun. So I made a call, I won't say to whom, <laughs> and I was put in touch with a man at City Hall who sat me down and explained, okay, if you're going to do this, here's what you're going to have to do. But he said, you have to understand that you're going to create a lot of headaches. I said, well, I'm not an employee of the city. Nobody, you know, the cardinal signs my check, not the mayor, not the fire commissioner. So I said, let's go for it. And it involved a lot of wheeling and dealing because at that time, Mike Madigan was the Speaker of the House, Democrat, and Pate Phillip was the President of the Senate, Republican, and they hated each other. Hmm. They hated each other. They never cooperated on anything. And you needed both sides. I had to have both sides. Right. They both had to sign off on this. So as it turned out, the getting Mike Madigan to sign off, I had driven down to Springfield. I met with his chief of staff, you know, presented the whole thing. And he said, you know, Father, you know, the speaker has no problem with this. We'll sign off on this. And I said, okay, thank you. He said, but you're on your own when it comes to the Senate. It turns out, and I had remembered this, it was tucked away in the back of my mind somewhere. There was a fire lieutenant on the job, and he and Pate Phillip served together in the same Marine Corps unit in Korea. <laughs> wow. So... I gave him a call. I stopped over at the firehouse to see him, and I said, how good of friends are you with Pete Phillip? <laughs> and he said, well, we're very good friends. We talk to each other once a week. So I explained what I wanted to do, and uh, he said, I'll talk to him. And so he calls me. He says, you have an appointment in Springfield tomorrow at 10 in the morning with Senator Phillip's chief of staff. So in the car at six in the morning, on my way to Springfield, and presented everything. And uh, uh, Senator Phillips, chief of staff, said, well, he said, the senator and the speaker don't normally work together. He said, but this involves widows of firemen. And he says, I think he'll go for it. And he did. So we got the bill, we protected oh their pensions uh, for life and all future widows. But it, it, it did, it, it pissed off a lot of people. I know that, that you took a lot of criticism from people who, in, in my opinion, were just ignorant of what you were actually trying to do. And if you remember back, did that criticism get you during the funeral processions uh, where you spoke at uh, Ankum and Stringer, where did well, that, I didn't, did that I get didn't, back to you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, the, you know, Eddie Stringer, at Eddie Stringer's funeral, I, I, you know, I really prayed hard over whether I was going to put that line, and you obviously know the line about, you know, that, that at that time there was just a lot of discussion about whether firefighters and paramedics and other first responders are paid too much, whether their pensions are too rich. Um, you know, their benefits, you know, as public employees, are their benefits too big? And, and there was a lot of stuff going on, um, uh, you know, on talk radio, in the paper, even, even in political bodies like the House, the Senate, the City Council. So I put a line in Eddie Stringer's funeral about, you know, people say, you know, firemen are paid too much or firemen's benefits are too great. I put my hand out of his casket. I said, 
what price do you pay for this? How much is too much for this kind of sacrifice? Yeah, Richie Daly was not a happy camper. Let me tell. In fact, at Corey Ankum's funeral the next day, he wouldn't even look at me. He wouldn't talk to me. And uh, so, but wow. you know, it needed to be said. It needed to be said because people people don't realize what you guys and the people out there listening to this, what first responders do every day. And I, I've said it at more than one funeral. In the morning, you put on that blue uniform, you don't know if you're coming back. Would it surprise you to know that you did 20 line of duty deaths? Is that number accurate? Well, yes. Well, it, there were 23, in, in, but I, I've had to do 20 to 2D death funerals, yes. And I've had to notify 23 families. 23 too many. Yeah. And then all the active members who've died. So for people who don't understand the role of a chaplain in the fire department, can you tell us what your official capacity is? Like, what is your actual job description as a chaplain for a fire department? I used to tell people, I'm the parish priest for the fire department. Whatever you need, uh, you know, funerals, baptisms, weddings, um, uh, counseling, hospital visits, home visits, uh, just what any priest, minister, rabbi would do is what you do. You just look at the fire department is your congregation. Right. So you are a spiritual guide. You are a, a ceremonial officer in a sense. Whatever they ask of you, you respond to. And that that's I always viewed that. That was my ministry. And it's a completely non denominational it is, yeah. position, correct? Yes. There there are three chaplains, uh Pastor Clark, uh, Rabbi Wolf and my well then myself, now Father John McNallis. But and as I always said to them, I'm not the Catholic chaplain, you're not the Jewish chaplain, you're not the Protestant chaplain. We're just chaplains for the fire department. So um in fact, what, what, there was a fireman later became a chief, and he got hurt three different times on the job. All three times I was either off or out of town. And he says, what is this? He says, I keep getting the other guys. He said, you never, <laughs> you never show up. And I said, sorry, you know, but I just wasn't there. But, you know, people expect, well, I'm Catholic, so the Catholic priest should show up. Well, not necessarily. You know, Rabbi Wolf and Pastor Clark and Father McNellis, they do the same thing I do. And as well. Now you you had a uh, you had a buggy. You responded to incidents, correct? Correct. Uh, what what type of incidents for the non fire service uh, listeners out there? What type of incidents did you respond to? Well, the alarm office would notify me on all extra alarm fires. So how did they notify you? Phone call at home? Or? It was back then. It was an alphanumeric pager. Okay. And then just on the cell phone, the, they were able to, like, text it. Uh, and I don't know how <laughs> things like that work, but it worked. So it, it was uh, either a page or a phone call. And all extra alarm fires, any time a firefighter or paramedic was injured, um, any unusual incidents, um, any time they, they thought that a chaplain was needed, they sent me. So Steve has a, was able to get some information on a, one of the coolest stories I've kind of heard about recently, just period, regardless of the fact that you're here today, but um, he did some research. So I want you to kind of recall this with Steve if uh, hopefully his information is correct. Am I getting blindsided? No, here? no, 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 not at all. So, no, I, all right. we, we were thinking, you know, we were trying to come up with, you know, yeah. we knew you were full of stories, 30 years in the fire service, being oh, the yeah. chaplain, uh, but we wanted to come up with some things. And I remember I was, I was at the firehouse yesterday, kind of laying in bed, and I remembered my mom told me that St. Robert's burnt down. Yes. And that was kind of like your your home parish, right? Your first parish. Uh, so that was... What year was that? 1989, May 8th, I think. Oh, my God. It was Mother's Day. That's oh. <laughs> the only reason I, I remember it. So uh, there was a quote in the paper that uh, uh, they said the, the bishop of the church right. had a uh, special item, and you and the guys went in there to go get it? Well, what happened was this. The, the church was pretty heavily involved in fire. And in the Catholic tradition, the consecrated hosts are kept in the tabernacle. 
And so that's important uh, from a theological point of view that to try to preserve that. So I wanted to go get the tabernacle, and the chief fire marshal, 215 at the time, was not my biggest fan, nor was I a fan of his. So the, the way St. Robert's was constructed, the, the, the beams were exposed beams, and they're 32-ply. So those things weren't coming down anytime soon. And, and there was a tremendous amount of fire in the roof line in the front, the vestibule of the church, but where the tabernacle was, was in the back. So I waited for him to, he was going to go do a 360 of the building. And as soon as he left, I grabbed the crew from truck 58. We went in with two Halligan bars and axe and popped that thing right off its stand and <laughs> carried it out. And uh, we saved it. Can you describe what the tabernacle, like, it's what's a, it constructed of? What does it look like? It's gold. It's a metal gold, um, very ornate usually. It, it, this was, I, I think this one is was constructed of brass actually because it was it, it weighed over 100 pounds easily. So, and I knew how it was situated, so I knew we could get it off real quick. And... Uh, yeah, so I had Dominic Gibson with me. I knew Dominic could tear it. If anybody could tear it off, Dominic could. So um, we went in there, and we, we got the tabernacle and got out, and uh, the chief came back around, and he, he was not a happy camper. <laughs> but the bishop was, so I, I didn't care about the chief. In the in the, the newspaper article I saw, uh, the he had a chalice that was given to him in the 1950s. Well, that was, yeah, no, that that was later on. So afterwards... The, the entire roof had come in, and it, of course the 32-ply beams stood the whole time. And that's another story about Tower 23's brand new rig. But uh, anyhow, <laughs> um, so then we went digging. It, it, the, in the sacristy, which is behind the altar area, there was a fireproof safe where all the sacred vessels and other things of value were kept. Okay. So same thing, I took my favorite truck, Truck 58, with me. Hmm. And we went in there, and we dug, and we dug, and we dug, and we came out with his ch the chalice his parents had given to him. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Still today your best save? <laughs> oh, no, I've had a couple of good saves. <laughs> well, well, while we're on that, like, tell us about like what, what comes to mind when you, you, know, you, you think about like, your good saves. Like I, we, we had a, a wicked, horrible night. Uh, this is back in... Oh, gosh. It was the first time that Harry's lumber burned. But we had a 211 on the south side, like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, I got home from that, took a shower, went to bed. I mean, I no sooner put my head down, the pager goes off. 211 alarm. It was on Northwest Highway. It turns out it was Harry's lumber. Okay. Which burned 25 years to the day later. <laughs> now, that was the second time it burned. So... I got there, turned into a 511. We were there all night and uh, got struck out in the morning. I went home. I thought, okay, I'm going to catch a, you know, just a couple hours of Z's. Got home. Pedro goes off again. We had a, another 211 in a courtyard building near Ravenswood Hospital. So, you know, I, and now I'm dead tired. So it's about 1030 in the morning. To get, that gets struck out. And I, I was living at St. Joseph at church at Fullerton and Southport at the time. So I'm heading home down Ashland Avenue, and I'm driving, and I, I look up, and I see this header. I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it was one of those just straight-up columns, and I thought, that's probably an auto, you know. And I pull up on Ashland Avenue. It's the back end of this frame just rolling, just rolling in fire. And so I call the office, and... Uh, I said, give me a full still. <laughs> I said, I got a fire to 2527 North Ashland. By the orders of 411? Yeah, so I know I didn't even say that. <laughs> hey, this is Father Tom. <laughs> yeah. I ditched my car because I didn't want to block, because I knew. I, it, and I, I ran to the back, and it was an enclosed back porch, totally involved. You know. So I ran back to the front, and here's this mom and this girl up in the second floor window. And I thought, oh, good Lord. So it was real simple. It was just run up the stairs and bang on their door and get them out. And, uh, uh, but I ended up boxing it. So, <laughs> so, and it needed the box. They used all four engines, you know, and all the trucks. So anyhow, 
Commissioner Orozco and Chief Keogh were coming from the same fire I was. And uh, when they got there, so we're in front, and Keogh comes up to me, and he points his finger at me, he goes, you know what, if you ever box anything again, I'm going to start saying mass. <laughs> 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 and then I had, um, I, I was doing ride time with Ambulance 6. So Ambulance 6 is at Wrigley Field. Right, right. 78's house, yeah. And uh, we had three shot one night, and it was just us. And uh, So you're, you're the third rider. Yeah, so by the time the second ambulance was there, everybody was intubated and had IVs going. Won't say how or why, but that's how, <laughs> that's how it happened. See, I mean, your role has the fire department chaplain crosses many boundaries. It does, but most of it is pastoral. The, the, the fire stuff, the lights and sirens stuff, that's 5% of the job. Yeah, and, you know, any busy fire company, every any busy ambulance, they have their particular area, their still district and Correct. the neighboring ones – you're actually citywide. Oh, yeah. So your still district is the entire city of Chicago. Yeah. So whenever somebody has a busy day and they're still, that's your busy day plus the rest of the city as well. Is there an average number of runs that you take a day? Like, Oh, it, it varied every day. It, yeah. You know, normally I, I had things I could predict. I knew... Uh, you know, I wanted to visit this person at this hospital or this person convalescing at home or I needed to stop by this firehouse or I wanted to stop by this firehouse. But there was always a wrench. I would call every morning, call medical. And before HIPAA and even after HIPAA, they would always let me know who's in the hospital. So that got added to the list. I, I put on usually about 28,000 miles a year on the buggy. And were you... 24 7 365 or oh, yeah. was there a designated day for I, well, you to be off i took wednesdays off but <laughs> not really you know <laughs> um yeah supposedly wednesday was my day off but during the day father McNeils was my assistant at the time he would cover the stuff but i would just stay on for the night stuff because usually when things went south it happened after 10 o'clock at night i also read that you were responsible for the gold badge? Yeah, I founded the Gold Badge Society. Well, that that's actually an interesting story. That's one of our charities that we're going to be supporting with this uh, podcast. So if you want to give us a quick rundown on that and you know, just kind of tell people what the Gold Badge is all about, shed a little light onto the Gold Badge Society. Its original roots were in 1988, but when I went to the commissioner then, uh, who didn't care much for me, and explained what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, and uh, he said no. He said the fire department wouldn't support it. I said, okay. So I waited for him to be gone, and the second day of Ray Orozco Sr.'s tenure as the uh, new fire commissioner, I met with him and I told him what I wanted to do and he looked at me and said, do it. And that's how it got started. So we met, interestingly, the first time at the Hard Rock Cafe. <laughs> they gave it to us for free, so I never turned down anything for free. <laughs> and uh, the Gold Badge Society is comprised of the widows, the children, the siblings, and the parents of firefighters and paramedics who have died in the line of duty. And they are a support group for one another and for any any person who suffers a, a duty death. Uh, this morning, they were with the Busio family. This morning, they had the bell ringing. It's one year, year ago today that Juan died. And they were there, the whole Gold Badge Society, with Juan's family for the bell ringing this morning. They, they take very, very seriously their role as support for duty death families. And most of the people on the board of the Gold Badge Society are widows and families of fallen members, correct? Not, not most, all. Okay. It's, it's not a group you want to belong to, to be honest. But all the members of the Gold Badge are related directly to a firefighter or a paramedic who's died in the line of duty. 
That's a great cause. Uh, Father, on top of, I mean, switching gears a little bit out of the funerals, um, weddings and baptisms, huh. any any stories that stick out with that that uh, that you can talk about at least? Weddings, the, the most important part of the wedding is at the rehearsal when I have to explain to everybody they are not to drink before the wedding starts, <laughs> that they have all afternoon and night to drink. So, I mean, there have been some interesting Interesting stories. Even though you are retired, the phone calls for the weddings and baptisms oh, still don't stop. No, no, <laughs> they don't. They don't. Uh, and that's okay. I, you have 37 years worth of relationships with people. You just don't turn that off. Mm-hmm. You, don't, mm-hmm. you don't say no. Right. You know, I, or at least I can't say no. <laughs> Anybody you out there listening, I'm going to change my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, Father Tom was there first thing in the morning, the night after my mom passed away, uh, to talk with my dad. And uh, I know for a fact that he was extremely comforted uh, just by your presence. Just stopping by. Hey, I'm here. Let you know. Uh, you know, you took you took him to the side. You talked to him for a little bit. And then uh, I, you did help uh, preside over the services for my mom, which mm-hmm. we were very appreciative. So, yeah, those relationships, man, they're there and they're real. Oh, yeah. But I mean, especially in the fire department, it's such it's such a wonderful bond. It's such a wonderful family. And, you know, to see the three of you, because I think you're seeing it too. Some some people aren't getting it. You know? They become firemen or paramedics for the check or the benefits. and. Is that what you've been noticing throughout your your tenure as a chaplain? Like, what other big changes did you notice from when you talk about the fire service back in the day as opposed to the fire service as we stand? I think and it's not just the fire service. You, you see it in organizations across the board. Um, people don't want to be involved. They have all these other things they want to do. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. We, we had a fireman. He was in the academy. And even though I can't admit this, but I will. (laughs) Anytime I knew a fireman in in the academy or a candidate in the academy who, you know, I had three cousins go through the academy. You know, kids I taught when they were at Tars or Roberts or wherever, I'd always pull them aside and I'd say, where do you want to go? And I said, I can't promise can't promise you, but if you, if you, you know, where do you want to go? And I had this one kid, and he, he told me the firehouse he wanted to go to, and I said, why? And he said, well, I got a plumbing business, and it's right down the block from my plumbing business. And I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So I sent him to the busiest truck in the city. <laughs> And you know what? He has never stopped thanking me to this day. I mean, he just, he loves it now. He loves it. But... It's that mindset that scares me that the side job is more important than this job. People, yeah. uh, some people are not willing to get invested. They don't want to be, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, yesterday was very disappointing. We had Memorial Day. And had it not been for chief officers and members of the command staff, the showing by firefighters and paramedics was pathetic. Well, we were on duty yesterday. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I know, I mean, it's, it, it, and it's, it's been declining. Rose Hill, Local 2 has a memorial service every year at Rose Hill Cemetery in the fall. Same thing. Guys don't show up. If you had a small group of men and women in front of you that were getting ready to prepare to be uh, firefighters or paramedics anywhere in the country, what would, you, what would you say to them? Well, tell them it's the best job in the world. Uh, but you you make the job what it is. And if you really don't want to be a firefighter or you don't want to be a paramedic, you shouldn't be one. That it, it, it doesn't take just brains and it doesn't take brawn. It takes heart. It takes heart and soul. You got to want to love it. You got to, you got to want to just do it and live it. And, and I'm not saying it's like the old days where, oh, you know, we go out and we do this together and we do that together. We go here together. We go fishing together, you know, that. It doesn't have to be that. But you have to be invested. You have to want to love the job. Uh, I remember there was an engineer at uh, Engine 78, Jimmy Sullivan. 
And that engine was like his baby. That hood, that whole cab was up every morning. He was on the creeper underneath that thing. He didn't have to do all the things he did, but that was his fire engine. And he treated it like he owned it, like he paid for it. And you don't see that kind of dedication. At least I haven't seen it lately. Yeah. But this is happening in volunteer organizations all over the place. You see it in church organizations, fraternal organizations. I mean, VFWs, American Legion posts, their numbers are declining. Young, young guys aren't stepping up. They don't want to be bothered. Even young veterans, they don't want to be bothered. Uh -huh. So it, it, it's, it, it's happening across the board, but especially in the fire service. Yeah, and, and going along with that, Father Tom, I mean, I don't want to say a new concept, but a relatively new concept that I was looking at. I mean, you you introduced critical incident stress management to the fire department. Well, to Chicago, yeah. To, yeah. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? What kind of... Yeah, the critical incident stress management uh, concept came out of the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jeff Mitchell uh, was the one who pioneered it. And um, what they realized by, through the studies done by the VA is that much like soldiers, uh, much like anybody in the armed forces, the incidence of PTSD was much higher among first responders than any other occupational group they, they had uh, looked at. So CISM was a seven-step process of, of working with people who have gone through horrific events or overwhelming events. And his research showed that if you reach somebody within 72 hours, you can mitigate the effects of the stress and therefore reduce the likelihood of PTSD. When you say reach that person, what, what does that entail? Well, it, it's a matter of reaching out to the person, sitting down, taking them through this process and getting them to talk about what happened, their reaction to it, giving them some tools to now um, uh, kind of repair the damage, the emotional damage that it does. Because, you know, for a lot of, a lot of first responders, you know, the, the, you know, your body's like a garbage can. You keep putting this stuff in and you keep pushing it down and pushing it down and pushing And one day it's just going to start overflowing. So if you can get people to get rid of it or talk about it or dump it out soon after the event, it can have a very healing effect. Well, I was talking to Jimmy O'Connell and I was telling him that you were going to be on and he wanted me to relate to you that you talked him into taking this class and it was the one thing that he used every single day oh, yeah. on the job. And so he wanted me to kind of put that out there and kind of relay that to you that he's been grateful that you actually talked him into that because he said he used it every single day of his career. Yeah. Well, we brought Dr. Jeff Mitchell to Chicago. He actually did the training himself, he and his team. And I went to the command staff at the fire department at that point, and uh, I got a grant for $5,000 to help train people. And, and I went to the commissioner at the time, and I said, I think at that time there was a the chief safety officer, and there were, I think, three or four other safety officers. And I said, you know, the chief of EMS, chief of fire operations, safety officer, I think they should all take this course. And the most resistance I got, of course, was from the command staff. Well, you know, we're busy, we don't have time, you know, but, and I said, you lead from the top. And, uh, but anyhow, we ended up training close to 50 people in the CISM process. We've had a lot of suicides lately on our department and with CPD. Is there something that somebody can look out for, let's say they may suspect somebody's going through some hard times or somebody just doesn't seem right. Are there things that they can look for that would be a red flag that maybe they should start reaching out or finding some help or, you know, what can the average person, the average member who's not trained in this can start 
helping? Well, first of all, listen. You know if something's not right. They're talking, you know, foolishness or um, there, there are certain signals like, people who withdraw who normally didn't before, people who start giving a lot of their stuff away. But people who are just, you know, women and men mm -hmm. who just, man, all of a sudden they're depressed, all of a sudden, no, something's not right. And one of the things you have to do is go up to them and say, hey, you okay? And we don't do that enough. We don't pull but guys aside and say, hey, is everything all right? You know, you just don't seem right. And if you do something, like usually somebody will open up and, and you can say, you know, let, let me try to get you some help. You know, I'll call one of the chaplains. Uh, you know, I'll call Liz Crow. I'll call whomever. I can't tell you. Thank God, you know, guys have gotten smarter. How many calls I've gotten, you know, hey, there's a guy in my firehouse. He's starting to do this or he's starting to do that. And you know, sure enough, you get over there, and this guy's he's he's hitting the bottom, and you get him the help he needs. Well, I think you have a quote that, in essence, uh, a cup of coffee at the firehouse table is one of your greatest tools. Oh, well, usually it's lunch or dinner, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, just stopping by, just stopping by, and that's. That's what a chaplain does. It's a ministry of presence. It's being there. Because I can't tell you how many firefighters or paramedics you're leaving or you're, you know, walking between one part of the firehouse or the other part of the firehouse and they'll grab you and say, can I talk to you for a minute? And sure enough, they're struggling with something. But people out there in the firehouses, trust your, trust your heart and your soul. If something's not right, there's something wrong with them. And don't be afraid to push him. Don't be afraid to pull him aside and say, is everything okay? Can I help? You've been, in your tenure, you've responded to some of the biggest historic fires, you know, in that we've had, you know, in, in modern times. Um, the first one that comes to mind is the Paxson Hotel. Mm. And yeah. from what I've read that impacted you and it had a huge impact on members, um, can you talk about that? Yeah, that was the worst fire I've ever been to. Um, I was on the road. I was on my way home. I was living in, on the near west side at Notre Dame Parish at Harrison and Loomis. And Ray Hoff was the captain of Truck 10. And there wasn't much that phased Ray Hoff, but I could tell by his voice something was horribly wrong because they were the first ones on the scene. He boxed it right away. And he just said, I got people hanging out windows. So I got there awfully quick, and it was, there were literally people hanging out windows begging for their lives. And there weren't enough ladders, there weren't enough people, and people had already jumped. I was in front, Ambulance 11 was there by themselves, and I mean, they policemen were dragging body, broken bodies. People had jumped out of windows to the ambulance. 11, ambulance 11 was overwhelmed. They ended up being triage. And so we set up a triage area south of the fire building. It was just, it was overwhelming because you could hear the people screaming for help and knowing that not everybody was going to be reached. You know, that Thursday before, we graduated an academy class. And... Sunday of the Paxson Hotel fire for 12 of them it was their first day on the job. That's amazing. Their first fire, their first day was the Paxson Hotel. We had one young candidate made five ladder rescues his first day on the job. Uh, and this was in uh, March of 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, 15 that perished, 25 injured. 20. Uh, 20. 20 died. 20 perished. Um it was a single room occupancy building. Correct. Multi story. Uh, they said about 130 people lived in the building. I, I know it was over 100. I don't know exactly how many. Uh, what it what it happened was they had long hallways, no fire breaks, and people had propped doors open where there should have been, you know, fire breaks or hallway doors. So it it, it traveled both a horizontal and a vertical chimney 
through the whole building. It was interior stairwells. The next morning we were there still, and they were absolutely gone, consumed. There, were, there was nothing. It, it was the, the intensity of the fire was incredible. And that not only affected you, but all the members. What did you do to kind of alleviate some of that? Well, I, I tried reaching out to all the still and still in box companies the next workday. Um, you know, just go around to the firehouses to check and see how guys were. And I mean, people just still were sitting around the table just holding a cup of coffee. They couldn't even really talk about it. Do you find it's better just to let that be for now, come back and address it? Or is do you no, feel to be aggressive at that point to get them to talk? I didn't want to be aggressive. We didn't have CISM at the time. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I, I didn't – I relied on the company officers to – clue me in if there were guys who needed help. Some of them did, but some of the company officers were pretty traumatized by it too. You know, having to make that decision of who gets a ladder to what window, that's, I mean, that's unimaginable that you have that, you have to make that life and death decision, who lives and who dies. And really that's, that happened. So you kind of just made your presence known? Well, I, there were certain guys I did single out. And okay. certain guys, the officer said to me, you know, you really need to talk to him. Okay. Um, and a number of the candidates were just, you know, two of them wanted to quit after that. I mean, the one, you know, the one told me, he, you know, he kept having nightmares just hearing people scream. And you know, luckily he stayed on and he's a chief now. So... He's done okay. We kind of put it out there for people who had questions for you. And uh oh, uh oh. Well, we're, 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 we'll, we'll kind of we'll, we'll kind of stay on track here All right. with this because we screen the it, questions it, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris Malayli wanted to know with all that you have seen over thirty years, what's your coping mechanism? How do you deal with this? And is there someone you go to? I mean, you said that the Paxton fire was impacted you the most. Yeah. Who, where does Father Tom go? To my chief. For me, prayer is, that's the number one resource for me. Um, I have two great priest friends who we get together usually once a week, and we talk a lot about a lot of things, and we're a great support to each other. Um, I've availed myself of professionals. Um, Liz Crow has been a great, great guide and support for me through the years. I think we've guided and supported each other. So I, I have a number of outlets that, that I use. Are there any other memorable fire uh, or incidents? Um, E2 under your... Oh, that was horrible. Jeez. Yeah. E2, I got there pretty quickly. So before we get into that, there are people out there who don't know what E2 is. E2 was a nightclub uh, on the near south side, 21st and Wabash, I think it was, 20th and Wabash. And it was a second floor club. The back door was locked. So there was only one point of egress, which was the front door, the front stairwell. A fight broke out during a dance party, and pepper spray was discharged. And then somebody yelled, shots fired. And people just started going down the stairwell. This is 2003. Yeah. Okay. And it was a bitter cold night. I still remember how bitter cold it was that night. People got trampled and everything got bottled up at the front door and nobody could get it. It was a wall of people, literally a wall of people. Police officers, bus drivers, everybody were trying to pick people out. And so finally... I forget what fire company finally popped the rear door and got in there and then tried to get the people back out from the top of the pile to the back door. But it, w it was pretty gruesome. I forget a number of people died. So it wasn't a fire. No. It was somebody said shots fired and... The security guard peppered... The, the fight broke out. The security guard used pepper spray. That caused the initial panic. And then somebody apparently yelled, shots fired. And that's when everybody started running for the exit. Okay. And they were, they were literally, 
bodies piled up on top of each other up the whole stairwell. You can see videos of the they're still talking, they're stacked oh, up and oh, they're, they're screaming and, and yeah. you can't pull the people from the bottom no. because there's 20 more people stacked on top of them. Yeah. Um, 21 people died that day. Was it 21? Oh my, I, I forgot how many it was. Yeah, it was, it was again, once again, it was, it, it was very wicked for those first responding companies, but it, it, we couldn't get the ambulances in and out quick enough. And so, you know, as soon as an ambulance came, somebody was loaded on, you know, they worked them and off they went. Next ambulance, they, they backed the ambulances, was it at Wabash or Michigan, I forget, but it was just a stream of ambulances. And it was like, next victim, boom, next ambulance, boom, go. So, so far we have the Paxson Hotel, mm -hmm. E2. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that comes to mind when you think about the ones that really impacted you? Yeah, we had, a, when I was fairly new, we had a fire. It was around 16th and um, Costner. And we had seven dead, five of them were kids. And I was relatively new to this, and uh, that hit me hard because I went up there to bless them all. I, you know, all the troops that were up there. I said, "Come on, take off your helmets." And we prayed and blessed the, you know, the bless the bodies. And that was my first one where I saw multiple kids dead from burns and smoke inhalation, um, only to come out and end up getting in a fight with the fire commissioner. So. <laughs> it was the frosting on the cake, so to speak. <laughs> he didn't care much for me, that mm. fire commissioner herself. So. <laughs> what are you batting with these uh, with these commissioners? 500 uh, 50, maybe? 50, 50. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah about 500. Yeah. 500 yeah. a good, that's, yeah. that's good yeah. average. Good. It's a great average in baseball. <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> some of them didn't like the fact I was politically active. I think some were threatened by I was popular. Um I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I know the first commissioner didn't want me to be the chaplain, so he had always resented me. Speaking of speak of you being appointed commissioner, or, or commissioner. Oh, speak thank of you. you being, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I, um, speak of you being appointed uh, chaplain. Did you have any advice that you gave your predecessor after? Uh... Yeah, and, and and before you answer that. Oh. When I when I called you, you were hesitant to do this because you said that you didn't want to step on the toes. You thought this was more a talk about the chaplain's role and stuff like that. So I said that we'd give you the opportunity to kind of transition into the new chaplain and tell us about the new chaplain. So yeah. if you want to, you know, start with that, you can tell us about who took your place and yeah. then you can, you know, what advice you gave. Well, Father John McNallis took my place, and Father John was my assistant for 30 years. Hmm. So he knows the ropes. It was, it was nice in a way that I didn't have, I didn't have to tell him anything. <laughs> you know, John, John handled, in his time, two duty deaths while I was out of town. So he's gone through that, which is the most difficult part of the work of a chaplain. Um, you know, showing up at somebody's door at two o'clock in the morning is not pretty. But uh, so John, no, John really fit right in without without a problem. And so he he knows the fire service, he knows Chicago, he knows firefighters and paramedics, and he's doing a fine job. So he already knew the secret handshake and everything. Oh yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Let's go to uh, June sixteenth, uh, twenty seventeen. One of your last days. You responded to a fire, Grand and Holman. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, indeed. Just a you know uneventful, pretty good fire, but you know it wasn't a obviously it wasn't a Paxton Hotel fire. Um, tell us about that day. There was something memorable that happened there, correct? Well, that was the the, the, the night of my retirement party. I didn't get home till 12.30, 12.45, and I had forgotten to put myself out of service. <laughs> so I, I told Father McNallis, I said, you know, you got the duty tonight, and I'd forgotten to call the alarm office. So at whatever time it was, 2.45 or 2.50, they call and they said, listen, we got a 2.11, you know, whatever, on Grand Avenue. And I thought, you know what, I'm awake. 
Why wake him up? So I took it in. Turns into be a 311. And uh, so Chief Don Roma was the incident commander, and uh, I was standing next to him. He says, he said, I, I think I'm going to strike this out. And I said, good, because I want to go home and get some sleep. And he goes, you know what? Better yet, you strike it out. So <laughs> I said, okay. So I got on the radio, and, and I, I, there's a backstory to this because at the fire alarm office. So the dispatcher at the fire alarm office was Ann Renocchio, and her husband's a fireman on the job. I grabbed the microphone and I said, 411 the main. And Ann answered the radio, and she said, yeah, 411. I said, on my orders, strike out the 311. <laughs> well, there was a pause. <laughs> and then she announces that it struck out. Well, what had happened was she was sitting in her chair. She spun around and looked at Danny O'Donnell, who was the senior at the fire alarm office, and put her arms out like, huh? And, <laughs> and Danny O'Donnell said, strike it out on his orders. And that's how it happened. <laughs> yeah. Calling boxes, striking boxes. Yeah. Did that, hap- did that happen twice where you, you struck it out, or was that no. the only time? Only there time. Was, yeah, that was the only time? Only time. There was actually because uh, I was uh, detailed to the ambulance that day. We were we were at the fire and and the the chiefs were running around and they're like, "Turn up your radio because Father Tom's gonna strike out the box," you know. Oh, okay. And uh, but there was a stillin box alarm going on at the same time, not far away from that uh, from that uh, fire also. Oh, I don't remember that. I just wanted to go home and go to bed. That's, <laughs> that's all. I want to get some sleep. Right. That may that may have been the quickest strikeout. On the radio yeah. in CFD history. Yeah. Why we have this opportunity? Um, what charities are you supporting right now? Like, you know, let's um, kind of support whatever charity it is that you want, and you know, we can put that out there and try to get support for what the charities are that that you're supporting right now. Is there anything that you want to? Just the one, the Gold Badge Society. Okay. Well, that, that's a big one for us, too, yeah, and yeah. we'll put um, links and uh, um, ways to support that. Um, anybody there that you want to, um, you know, speak for as far as, you know, is how can people get involved in that? How can people support that? Well, they have, uh, if you go to cfdgoldbadgesociety.com, um, it, it'll pop up. That's their website. And uh, they do, you know, they do so much. Uh, they're, they're involved not only in Chicago, but they're involved on a national level. Uh, we have the Memorial Park on the lakefront. They went from firehouse to firehouse to firehouse raising the funds for that, selling T-shirts, doing this, that, and everything. The, this incredible park on the lakefront dedicated to the 575 firefighters and paramedics who have died in line of duty. There is a tree planted for each one of those members on that lakefront and the in confines of that park. They, as I said, they support each other and especially families, especially the new families right now. They're very involved with the Busio family. Um, that memorial is right by McCormick Place. Just south of McCormick Place. Right on, on that lake path. Right. So if anybody wants to go there, it's it's just south of McCormick right. Place on the bike path. Right. Um, but they work very closely with the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. You also were an integral part of the International Association of Firefighters, right? I'm the chaplain for the International Association of Firefighters presently, yeah. And you've implemented a bunch of um, policies as, as far as fallen firefighters and uh, uh, paramedics and stuff? No, not, no, not really. I mean, the, the IAFF has policies and procedures that they do and offer to uh, member departments uh, when a, fall, a firefighter or paramedic falls in the line of duty. The National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, I also work very closely with them. And we have, uh, they've, they've, we're part of, it's a 16-step life safety initiative that they have developed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And chaplaincy, we have inserted chaplaincy as a part of that 16-step uh, program. And we've chained, trained chaplains across the country on how to implement that. So I feel really good that, that I'm able to do things on a national basis that are benefiting okay. not only chaplains but firefighters and medics. So you, you never really retired? 
Uh, no, not really. I mean, you're you're still doing the. the How much the, Jeopardy can you watch in one day? <laughs> <laughs> you're still doing the chaplain at uh, St. Mary's, yes. St. Mary of Providence. I St. Mary of Providence is a residential facility for developmentally disabled women, so I'm the chaplain there. Yeah. And uh, you're on the uh, board over at my alma mater, also. St. Patrick's High School. I'm on the board of trustees there, and the IEFF, the National Fallen Fighters Foundation. So they, there's enough to keep me busy. Yeah, I was just going to ask you a little bit, Father Tom, about, um, so you were born 1951. Correct. On Chicago's west side. Correct. Um, would you mind maybe telling us a little bit about that or how, you, yeah, I grew how up. life was growing up for you? Oh, it was great. I was one of eight kids. We lived in a four-room apartment. Uh, <laughs> go figure. Uh, five, no, it was five rooms. Now they think five. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. About three years ago, I'm in the buggy. I don't know where I was going. And engine 113, which was where I hung out as a kid, pulls up and says, I got fire blowing out the windows on Laramie Avenue. So I called the alarm office. I said, where's 113's fire? He said, 402 South Laramie. I said, that's where I grew up. Yeah. So... Lit it up, head over there. Sure enough, there's f fire blowing out the apartment we grew up in. And so I'm standing in front with Mike Timothy, and he looks at me and goes, as only Mike Timothy can say, what you doing here? <laughs> and I said, you're burning down my home. No and, pressure. Yeah. So I was amazed. We, we went up there afterwards. I couldn't believe how small that apartment was. We all of us packed into this apartment, but yeah, it was, my dad was a cop, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and they, we they never owned a, ho a house. We lived in apartments our whole lives, and but growing up on the west side was great. It was fun. It was sim it was a simpler time. I, I can't imagine what it's like being a kid growing up today. Can't even imagine. Was your father a police officer in the 15th district? No, no, he was. Uh, he was started off in Marquette the old Marquette, which is the 10th district now, got promoted to detective. He became a youth officer, then got promoted to sergeant and stayed in the youth division, got promoted lieutenant and stayed in the youth division. He was the lieutenant commander of the 5th Area Youth Division. What about your grandfather? Grandfather, grandpa, was he was a policeman in 23, town hall. And, uh, in fact, my dad worked for a while in, in 23 with him. <laughs> you're... you're your grandfather was your father's supervisor? No, no, okay. no, no. Grand, my grandfather was a beat cop, just like my dad at the time. Uh, what drove you to the priesthood back then? The nuns, they beat it into me. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had an uncle who was a priest, a uh, great guy, wonderful guy down in Springfield, Illinois. And, but we had a young priest at the parish at Resurrection where I grew up, Father Mike Rochford, who was very much impressed me. And that, so that... That was the, I think, the impetus. And you, and, uh, and you went to Quigley South, right? Went to Quigley South. It was kind of crazy. After we moved from Van Buren and Larmy, we moved to Adams and Cicero. And there were two Quigleys. Quigley North was downtown, right around Chicago and Rush. Quigley South was at 77th and Western. But because they used the city dividing line, so since I lived two blocks south of Madison Street, I took me an hour and 40 minutes every day to get to Quigley <laughs> South instead of 20 minutes to get to Quigley North. But So, yeah, Quigley South at 7, now St. Rita's High School. What, what made you decide on Loyola? Well, Loyola was combined with the seminary. So our, our degree program is actually – so we did two years at the college seminary, the first two years – at the college seminary, and then the last two years at Loyola University. Okay. Yeah. Anything else that you would like to air while you have this opportunity? My dirty laundry. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Grievances. Nah, <laughs> I've got. I'm Irish. I got a lot of grievances <laughs> and, and grudges. Uh, for those of you who are first responders who are listening, this is an incredible job and a wonderful opportunity in your life to really, really do something to make a difference in people's lives. And so do it, you know, embrace the job, let it embrace you. And, but most of all, just be safe, be smart. Um, Pat Lynch, I remember when Pat Lynch, 
when he was at the academy, Lieutenant Pat Lynch, he always used to tell him, he says, you only need three things to put out a fire. You need water, balls, and common sense. <laughs> well, trust the common sense, especially. Yeah, I was... Please, Father, I, I, we've never done this before. I don't know if we ever will again. Do you want me to sing? Could I uh, no. maybe no. do a little diddle for that? Uh, uh, could, could I ask you to lead us in a closing prayer? Sure, sure. Let's pray. Lord God, you've blessed us all with incredible gifts. And for those who are part of this wonderful, wonderful group called the Fire Service, you have allowed us to touch people's lives in ways that others will never know. Allow your servants, these firefighters, these paramedics, these police officers, these dispatchers, allow them to truly touch the hearts and lives, to, to change people's lives, to save lives, and to make their life a little bit better. Bless all those who serve this day and every day Bless them with safety, with your compassion, and with your love. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father Tom. Thank you very much, Father Tom. All right. Thank you for listening to Chicago's Bravest Stories. Like and subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. It will help our charities like the Gold Badge Society and other charities that our guests are supporting. Also, we'd like to ask you guys for your help. A member of ours brother has gotten ill. He's been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. He is the fire paramedic on Ambulance 33, his brother Abraham Khalil. We need your help. If you can go to the GoFundMe page under Abraham Khalil, K-H-A-L-I-L, anything would really help out the family during this time. So if you can help out at the GoFundMe page, Abraham Khalil, K-H-A-L-I-L. Thank you. We'd also like to thank the Missing Chums for their musical contribution to the podcast with the song, Yes You May. Hey guys, if you're a first responder or you know a first responder that has a story to tell, we'd love to hear it. Please reach out to us at Chicago's Bravest Stories on Facebook or Instagram. You can download this episode on iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and TuneIn. Thanks for joining us. Also sponsored by Chicagoland Event Medical Services, we are a first responder owned and operated first aid and emergency medical service provider. Our mission is to protect the lives and well-being of event patrons all over the state of Illinois by providing professional and experienced career EMS practitioners in an event setting. Our services are completely customizable to the needs of our customers. Our business was born out of a necessity to provide competent health care providers to both large and small events. We do this by bringing firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, nurses, lifeguards, first aid tents. We also customize your own site safety and emergency response plan, and that information will always be available to your staff. We pride ourselves on providing the best patient care possible to your events. Hey everybody, it's Steve here. I'd like to talk to you about another awesome company that helps bring the podcast to you free of charge. Chicagoland CPR. It's a first responder owned and operated CPR company. As a first responder myself, I can't express to you enough how important CPR training is for everybody in the community. They offer real customizable world-class education for all their clients. They have a combined 30 plus years of field experience as fire service and EMS educators throughout the Chicagoland area. Chicagoland CPR is extremely focused on providing real world, no fluff education. And the main focus is on organization, an engaged classroom, working with students to completely understand the material, getting your uh, certificates out on time, and most importantly, coming to your facility. They offer a wide variety of American Heart Association classes, CPR, first aid, AED, ACLS, PALS, and a full complement of Star Guard Elite, Lifeguard, and Aquatic Safety classes. Our clients include nursing homes, hospitals, long-term care facilities, fire departments, schools, park districts, coaching staff, and many other groups throughout the communities. If you're interested in hosting a class at your facility for your employees, or you have any questions about services and pricing, contact Chicagoland CPR. You can find them on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, the World Wide Web. I can't express to you, again, how important CPR and first aid training is. They want to hear from you soon. 
give them a call, find them. Let's set you up a class to help save some lives.